U.S. sanctions against Venezuela means that insulin, cancer drugs, even dialysis machines are not available to the general population. Today on Roundtable Perspective, Dr. Stephen Eleanor joins me in examining the recent history of Venezuela, its social programs, its current economic crisis, and the effect of U.S. sanctions have on the general population. Welcome to the Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Lee Arts. I'm joined today by my guest, Dr. Stephen Elner, who has returned right. to, re to discuss a crisis in Venezuela and U.S. sanctions. Dr. Elner got his Ph.D. in Latin American Studies at the University of New Mexico, and he's been teaching at the University of the Orient in Venezuela in politics and economics and written widely on Venezuela and Latin American history, it's almost like you're a part of it, having right. lived in Venezuela Certainly. for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, what we'd like to talk about today is um, what the U.S. has labeled, at least since the time of Obama, a threat to U.S. security. Venezuela is a threat to the world. Um, and when they present that, it's almost as if they could go back to the 70s and 80s when everything about Venezuela was lovely and they had beaches and winning Miss Univer right. Universe pageants and everything was nice and if we could just go back to that. Right. So we're presented here with a threat and it's contrasted with the 70s and 80s when everything was just delightful in Venezuela. Yeah. Well, not, not only the U.S. government, but, uh, but also uh, some Venezuelans who belong to the opposition <coughs> say the, th the same thing. Chavez was elected in 1998. And you hear some people say, you know, things were hunky-dory back in the good old days, uh, going back to the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, and Chavez came along and everything changed. So that was the cutoff date. Um, and that's really, that, that doesn't account for the fact that in the elections of 1998, Chavez was an outsider. He wasn't part of the establishment. He, you know, in Venezuela for a long time, you had the two-party system, just like in the States, so there's an alternation. But Chavez was not part of the establishment. He was an outsider with a very anti-party discourse. Mm -hmm. And not only that, Chavez won with 56% of the vote, but the other major candidate, who received, I believe, about 38% of the vote, also had an anti-party discourse, Sal Romer. And the one candidate of the four or five candidates that participated, the one candidate who represented the system was the Secretary General of Acción Democrática, which historically is the largest party in Venezuela. And he got 1%. Alfredo <laughs> Cero got 1% of the vote. So obviously there's a lot of discontent. Um, but uh, I think that there is an explanation for that. The situation in the 1990s was quite dire. Um, in 1989, there were disturbances after uh, the president announced an increase in the price of gasoline, and that kind of set off um, protests and then disturbances. The army was called in, and there were an estimated two to 4,000 people were killed. It's called the Caracaso. The Caracaso, yes. the Caracaso, which is really a misnomer because it began in Caracas, but it spread throughout the, the country. Is that referring to the the uh, shooting, or is that a f referring to the protests when, you, when it's defined as Caracaso? Caracaso. I mean, in popular imagination, is, it's, is this, that's when the military fired on us and the government yeah. fired on us? Is that how people see that, it? That, that's that's what, how people envision it. Okay. Uh, because the, uh, the looting was, was quite widespread, and people saw that, but they also know that the army was called in, uh, and there was a lot of bloodshed. So that, that stands out in Venezuelan history. I wonder, I mean, uh, when you're saying that, it's almost like an echo of uh, make Venezuela great again. Like, <laughs> there, there is a section of that society that would really like to have almost gated communities on the east side of Caracas where everybody's nice and all of the, all the Mercedes go and, and the poor live over here right. in the favelas or the barrios and they're on the hell side and everything was fine at that time. Right. And I can tell you, Lee, because I wasn't in either of the two categories. <laughs> I mean... Somewhere As a university a professor, I was middle class. <laughs> and there was a middle class in Venezuela. Because of the oil money, uh, you had a middle class, uh, not the majority of the population. But I remember talking about gated communities. I remember where I lived, 
um, people started talking about, you, you saw people raising their fences, their walls, so they became fenced in, yeah. and then people started talking about gated communities, and they started doing that. Um, so that when I first arrived in Venezuela in the 1970s, I remember walking around Caracas day and night, there wasn't any problem. But that changed in the 1980s and got worse in the 1990s. Was that the result of the changing economic conditions in Venezuela, like part of the whole neoliberal order that r reduced public services, increased privatization, step up austerity? I mean, it, right. it certainly didn't just happen in Venezuela, it happened in the United States, it right. happened in Greece and other countries. So is this part of what's going on? The oil prices collapse, the, the quality of life is disrupted, and you can't get to work because they raise the price on your bus fare. Right, right, that's true. And some of these people who think in terms of returning to the good old days, their point of reference is the 1970s. In the 1970s, the price of oil skyrocketed. Yeah. And that benefited the Venezuelan economy because Venezuela has always been dependent on oil going back to the 1920s. Um, but that changed in the 1980s, the early 1980s, the prices stabilized and then declined and then declined even more. So that the 1980s was not a good decade, but Venezuelans just assumed that if the president of the 1970s came back, oh, yeah. then the good old days would come rolling back. And that's exactly what happened, but the good old days didn't come rolling back. But Carlos Juntarez Perez, who was president in the 1970s. He did come back. That yes. he did come back. And, and people he's had, the one that did the, uh, the price, price raises, increase. right? He, he used the term great turnabout. Yeah. Uh, he, because in the 1970s, uh, the state provided a lot of services, and they nationalized, or more or less nationalized, oil and iron. Uh, so the state played a big role. They had money to do that. Uh, he comes back in the 1980s, and the situation was quite different. And he implemented neoliberal policies. Right. Uh, and that's when people took to the streets. They demonstrated. They rioted. And that, that was the kind of And the difference about Venezuela, which we're eventually getting to the current crisis, the difference yeah. in Venezuela was there was someone like Chavez that was an outsider that also was able to a, get a political formation together right. and gets elected to office. Right. And then, unlike Syriza or... Um, Cyprus and Greece didn't back off from his program to work for the poor, to work for the population, and began instituting changes, including allowing the population to participate. Right. Um, for me, that's something that's missing from most of the U.S. media, and most of the American people don't know what's happened in the yeah. last 20 years in Venezuela. So right. I was hoping you could give us some idea of what were some of the changes that what was it, 26 elections in the last 20 years that have been held and people have voted for the Chavez or the Chavistas 24 out of those 26 right. times? And, well, why? There must be some benefit to right. this. So what were some of those things that people could point to and say, we like that, we like this, this is why we're voting Chavista? Right. That, that, that's a good question because 20 years is a long time and somebody can be elected on the basis of a cheap populist kind of discourse. One time. But one time <laughs> or at best two. But Chavez was elected four times, yeah. and he got the highest percentage of votes in modern democratic history, 63% uh, in the elections of 2006. So that, that's, a, that's a good question that you're asking. And I think it has a lot to do with the social programs in which the community, the poor communities, um, were able to participate in decisions within their communities. Uh, you had the um, communal councils, which proliferated throughout Venezuela, and under a program that was uh, developed in 2006, they would meet in assemblies, or they meet, because I'm really talking present tense as well, assemblies decide the priority project for their community, they solicit funding from the government, sometimes they get the funding directly, they carry out the project, or a construction company does, but they oversee they so they, they discuss the issues in their community, they make decisions about the priorities, right. they make the decisions about where their efforts or where their funding's going, and then they also carry out the work. I, I think that's very significantly because, you know, half of the population in Latin American countries are mar marginalized. Mm -hmm. They work for the informal economy. They don't have registered companies or they're street peddlers, they work for themselves. 
And these people don't have any kind of organizational experience. Uh, they develop that experience as a result of the communal programs. So I think that's one, one explanation. Um, another explanation would be that the Venezuelan economy in the 1990s basically ceased to be Venezuelan because you had a massive privatization in which the state companies were sold off and not bought by Venezuelans, local capital. Yeah. That happened in Mexico to a certain extent with you know, Carlos Slim, who bought tele telecommunications in, in Mexico. But in the case of Venezuela, all these companies were bought out by international mul multinational capital. And some of the companies in the private sector, such as the cement company, which was owned by the Rockefeller of Venezuela, Eugenio mm -hmm. Mendoza, well, he died. And the Japanese bought it, and then it was sold to the Mexicans, the Cemex. Um, Verizon was the owner of the telephone company of Venezuela. So Chavez represented a kind of economic nationalism. People had the sensation. Well, the idea that uh, we've created this wealth, that's this right. wealth should that's stay right. here. That, yeah. that, that yeah, that's, was people's mindset. Yeah. And that's what Chavez did. He uh, nationalized those companies. Um, including, uh, I th in some form, oil, changing the royalties. But I think, I think that's a significant thing. It's not simply that Venezuela depended on oil, but that the profits from the oil, the wealth from the oil, was turned to these social programs. So right. sometimes the critique of Chavez is he's a populist, he's handing these things yeah. out, failing to think that that wealth that was produced was by the very people that are right. presumably getting these right. benefits. But the benefits are coming from the wealth that they've created. And it, most of these social missions mm -hmm. were funded by the, what, the excess wealth that was right. taken from the oil, especially right. when oil's at a very high uh, price per barrel. That allows mm -hmm. a lot of money to go for video committees or the missions that you're, the, right. the, the communal councils, so. Right, the, the oil law that was called La Ley Organica de Hidrocarburos, it was passed in 2001. And shortly after that, they tried to overthrow Chavez. There was a coup that succeeded for all of two days. But that was a reaction to that law and the land reform as well. So the law and the land reform laws were what specifically? Does it say taking the profits from the oil to, for the population? Was that? Well, in the case of the oil law, it stated that the companies that had mixed ownership, private, ca uh, private capital and state capital, but the state capital was 30% or right. less, that they had to be more than 50% state owned. Um, and later that was increased to 60%. So, that's, so that that's means what they there were, were more funds available for the government, for the population. Certainly, that, yes. certainly. As, as well as what you mentioned, the tax structure changed, the royalty uh, system changed, so the government got more benefits. And that happened in Bolivia as well yeah. with Morales when he came in in 2006. With the natural gas, yes. Yeah. That's right. So Chavez sets up this social fund, which is the basis for these not just the communal council, but the yeah. other missions. Right. I understand there were missions, right. missions, projects, essentially right. for, for what, multiple? Well, in different fields. In, in health, uh, there was the Mission Barrio Dentro, yeah. in which doctors, and in this case, Cuban doctors, because the Venezuelan doctors were unwilling to do this, they, they went they were in the to the barrios. communities. <laughs> they were in the gated communities. And they might have been in the center of right. the cities, okay. but not in the barrios, not, not in the slum. Uh, dwellings, and this is where they were located. There were 20, 30, 40,000 Cuban doctors that came in there, uh, and so they set up shop in the poor communities. Okay. And the other important mission was the education mission. Um, at the high school level, known as Barrio, uh, Mission Ribas, Mission Sucre, at the university level, I taught in that program for, for many years, uh, more or less as a volunteer. Um, but, you know, in the university system, uh, Venezuelans felt that they had a legal right to a university education, regardless of their grades at the high school level. Uh, that didn't work out that way in practice. And every year in Venezuela, at my university and all universities, there'd be protests, they'd, they'd take over the dean's office mm -hmm. in order to get their people in as students. Uh, so it's always a source of conflict. Well, this Barrio Mission, uh, Sucre uh, provided university education to, to all the, all my students were, were from the slum barrio areas. Uh, so that was, a, and there were hundreds of thousands of 
uh, the students who graduated. So on, the, on all levels, from the primary level to the secondary yes. level to the university level, and the, and the result of that mission? I mean, the result of the mission for health must be improved health. What's the result of the mission of the, well, for education? Well, if you want to fast track and look at the situation today, uh, no, the, the, the situation isn't that good uh, in terms of the public hospitals. The, the, the missions continue and they function, and, uh, but you know, the health mission, the Mission Barrio Dentro, it was really mainly primary care. Sure. So when something gets serious, you go to a hospital, there are public hospitals in Venezuela. Um, and there's no question about it. So that's a, that's a manifestation, getting back to the question of why people keep voting Chavez or Chavistas in office. Here's a manifestation. We voted for this. We get this clinic. Yeah. It's good for our health. That's we, right. vote, we vote for this. We have this educational system that right. we learn to read and write. Right. We voted for this. We have a what? F food that's uh, th th the necessary food is available at a reasonable price. Right. Each of those things um, are, pre are presented as this is, we, this is what we voted for, this is what we got, this is what we like, this is why we will keep going in this right. direction. Right. Which seems a social base for somebody that opposes that. There's not a big base for that, a big social support for the opposition to that. Well, uh, it, it all depends on which side of the tracks you're living R on. Precisely, and, precisely. And uh, one of the things that the middle class resented I imagine the upper middle class even more so, is that Chavez said, I'm the president of all Venezuelans. I was elected to work in order to improve the lot of everybody, and that's what I'm doing. But my priority is the popular sectors, the poor people, right. the poor people, because they need me the most. Now we have a crisis, and, but to get here, it didn't just happen because mm -hmm. these policies of Chavez, or these policies that were being fairly egalitarian and benefiting the general population, but it, it would make sense if the price of oil goes from $130 a barrel to $30 a barrel, mm. that's a big loss, right. and not just for the profits of any particular company, but the reduction of the social funds. So right. some of the support for the social programs also takes a dive, right. which now right. it appears like, for more it would seem like, well, we this may not work out for us, yeah. but I understand Something that we don't see in the media is that's supplemented by opposition, um, which wasn't just running in for offices, but there was, I mean, a, again, a physical manifestation of the opposition right. to these policies right. that appeared in the street, appeared with sabotage, appeared. Right. Could you talk some sure, about that? Sure, surely. The, the opposition in Venezuela, uh, almost from the beginning, was a disloyal opposition. That's a term that political scientists use. And it means that the opposition does not recognize the legitimacy of the government. Um, Even though they got 58% of the vote, it's illegitimate. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Okay. Uh, I, I would say in, in the first couple of years, that wasn't a problem. But w once that law, I mentioned the agrarian reform and the oil law was passed, that was in October of 2001, immediately, I mean, the cause and effect relationship was very obvious because immediately the opposition was on the street calling for the removal of Chavez from office. And then in December, the Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, initiated, or call, initiated the call for a general strike, which was really a general strike, it was more of a man lockout. Of managers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that led into the uh, uh, lockout or general strike in April, which is when they overthrew Chavez for yeah. two days. So obviously the opposition was, was out to um, bring about regime change. And, and that hasn't changed since then. Uh, they have, you know, So usually, how does the opposition that seems to be opposing a democratically elected government for as long as it's been in existence present itself as against a, a dictatorship for democracy? I mean, how do you, how do you make, that, how do you make right. that real? Right, well, um, for one thing, the, they're, they're quite inconsistent in that they participate in elections and in order to participate in elections, they have to tell their people that these elections are gonna be fair. They don't talk about electoral fraud. They don't uh, um, attack the electoral council because if they did, their people would stay home. Right. So up until the day of the elections,
you know, everything is going to work okay. When they win, everything's, everything's okay. Fine. You mentioned they won twice, and they did. They won in 2007, and they won in the, elec the elections for the General Assembly in 2015. Um, when they lose, with a few exceptions, they say that there was electoral fraud. But um, usually they don't use the term fraud. Usually they use other words. Sometimes they say fraud, but it, they, they talk about what uh, in English would be that it's not a, even, a level playing yeah, field. Yeah. Um, in Spanish, the term that's used is ventajismo. Ventajismo means you know, the government has more resources, the government has the state channel, um, and so it's not fair. They have that advantage. So this, so this opposition um, is opposing these democratic elections, opposing the social missions and the social programs, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't have a lot of purchase even, even when it's being distorted in the media. But in the last few years, this opposition has been able to kind of ride this uh, depression in the oil prices, the, the slumping of the economy, and the United States has gotten involved, although mm -hmm. I guess you could argue the U.S. has been involved for a long time yeah. through uh, support for some of the opposition. Yeah. So uh, we're, we're fast forwarding quickly, but we get to this opposition that's been around a long time, mm -hmm. and we get to this moment of economic crisis. And how does this play out that it becomes suddenly this major threat to the U.S. or to the world. Um, what's that, how does that get sliced so that we can understand it? Well, th as you say, the United States has opposed Chavez, frankly, from the outset. Uh, in fact, you know, who threw the first stone? I mean, Ch Chavez uh, didn't have kind words to say about Bush either. Yeah. But who threw the first stone? Chavez was very discreet when he was elected president, even before he was elected president, um, I remember. Uh, he was very discreet in everything that he said about the United States. That was under Clinton and maybe the first couple months of Bush. That changed when Chavez criticized the bombing of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. That day uh, changed things. The United States withdrew its ambassador. Um, the leading spokesman of the Bush administration, and I remember hearing this um, they said, Mr. Chavez, not a, very well, not a very good pronunciation of his name, Mr. Chavez obviously doesn't know what democracy is all about. So that criticism of the bombing of uh, A precursor to where we are that, today. That, that, changed, that was a game changer yeah. in terms yeah. of relations between Venezuela and the United States. But with regard to the current situation, uh, Obama really set the stage with that uh, executive order that you mentioned. Um, and then he created a list of people who were sanctioned, and Trump play, you know, built on that. So now, I don't know how many 60, 70 members of the Maduro government are being sanctioned. Now, that but, the, but the sanctions go even beyond that, so that, like, to be able to buy a dialysis machine, you have to use a U.S. bank to, to, to move your right. money, but if the bank says, well, you're being sanctioned, we can't buy the dialysis machine, which may not affect those 60 people. It's, affecting 15,000 people that right. need the machine. So right. the, the sanctions, I'm not sure the technicalities of how they're applied, but well, can't get penicillin, can't get cancer yeah. drugs, can't get, I mean, that's part of the sanction regime. Yeah, I, I'll tell you how, how it's applied. Uh, the, one of the sanctions says that the U.S. financial institutions uh, cannot purchase uh, bonds from the Venezuelan government. So the Venezuelan government cannot refinance okay. its debt. Now, it also affects all kinds of transactions because transactions are in dollars. The world economy is in dollars. So everything goes through U.S. banks. And when Steven Mnuchin, the Secretary of the Treasury, uh, says we're going to track down the funds, the hidden funds, the hidden accounts, the shells, that's the term that's used, um, that creates a sensation that we don't know who's who, so let's not do business with Venezuela. Anybody, right. So Venezuela, in effect, is being, there's a, a boycott. Uh, Venezuela is a nation, and that's affecting the economy in a big way. I don't know if it's going to get him back to the 1970s, but I, I think that the, the connections that, that you've made here about uh, where Chavez comes from in response to the austerity and neoliberal and the benefits that came and how this doesn't fit with the,
what, the gl almost global move to privatize just about yeah. everything. There's yeah. a resistance to that. And then I would say the worst travesty is to have people involved where they're actually making their own um, decisions. Right. And perhaps a threat of a good example, as right. they've said before. Right. So. That, that's subversive. Yes. <laughs> well, um, I don't think anything we've said here today is subversive. I think it's been fairly uh, informative, uh -huh. and I hope that our viewers appreciate it. And uh, you've been here with us twice. I hope that we can talk with you again. But it's all the time we have uh, on our program. Thank you, Dr. Steve Elner, for joining me today on Roundtable Perspective. I'm Lee Arts. See you next time. <laughs>